Hello, welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership podcast series. My name is Scott Miller, and I serve as your host and interviewer each week. Our podcast is the world's largest weekly leadership podcast, where each week we do our best to bring you an innovative mind, a futurist, someone who is progressive on a variety of topics, including culture, leadership development, building a high-trust organization, time management, productivity, as well as business development, building brands and marketing, and as the former chief marketing officer for the Franklin Covey Company, now the host and advisor to the firm of this podcast, I am delighted today to invite Alan Dibb, who is the author of Amazon's number one book on global marketing for five consecutive years. Alan Dibb is the author of the One Page Marketing Plan, Get new customers, make more money, and stand out from the crowd. Joining us today from Australia, Alan Dibb, welcome to On Leadership. Hey, Scott, pleasure to be on. Man, it's such an honor to have you here, Alan. You know, I wrote a book about marketing, and my book has done okay compared to yours. You are kicking me to the curb, which is why I was so excited to have you on today. Your book is such a practical guide for whether you are a solopreneur, entrepreneur, and a small or mid-sized company, and quite frankly, it should haunt some CMOs of large global (laughs) organizations. Uh, Take a few moments, Alan, and reorient yourself to our listeners and viewers about your own entrepreneurial history and why you came to author this book. Yeah, look, I'm certainly not from a marketing background. I started my first business. I was a dead broke IT geek. Uh, I started my first managed services company uh, and I was struggling to get clients in the door. And so uh, that took me on a decade long journey to really learn marketing the difficult, expensive way, which is through trial and error. Um, I spent, like I said, about a decade trying to learn marketing. Um, I finally kind of cracked the formula. I grew that company built that up uh, to be a a national business, exited that. Then uh, after that, I built a very high growth startup, which was in the telecommunication space. We went from zero to four years later, being in the top 100 fastest growing companies in the country. I exited that. And now I'm helping uh, business leaders and entrepreneurs from all over the world help develop their own marketing capabilities so that they can uh, experience rapid business growth as well. Alan, really honor you joined us today. Your book, The One Page Marketing Plan, is arguably one of the most practical marketing books. No fluff, no ethereal theories. I don't think you spend a whole lot of time talking about brand or even brand equity. You talk about how marketing leads to revenue. In fact, the tagline on the back of your book is, do not buy this book if you hate money, (laughs) because you're all about the connection between marketing and revenue, which is the lifeblood of every organization, including the passion of every you know, sales leader, entrepreneur, founder, CEO, board of directors. In fact, one of my favorite parts of the entire book is fairly early on, when you talk about the difference between large company marketing and small company marketing, you, you basically talk here how large companies have different agendas for their marketing, pleasing mm-hmm. the board of directors, appeasing yeah. shareholders, satisfying superiors' biases, satisfying existing clients' preconceptions, winning advertising and creative awards, getting buy-in from various committees and stakeholders, and then finally making a profit. I had to chuckle as the CMO of a public company for eight years. And then you said, but the marketing priorities of a small business owner look something like this, making a profit. (laughs) I think that resonated so well. Talk to the, the, the posturing, the positioning, the bureaucracy and the politics of how marketing gets kind of in a quagmire in large organizations and why for startups and new entrepreneurs and small business owners, which quite frankly, even the largest of companies should operate and look like, why it becomes so um, such a muddy landscape for us. Yeah, look, uh, as a as an aspiring entrepreneur in my first business, I was looking at some of the what the big large companies were doing. And I thought, hey, if they're doing this from a marketing perspective and I follow what they're doing and I model what they're doing, I'll be successful as well. And of course, uh, different strategies work at different levels. And like you said, uh, the agenda of a lot of large companies is quite different to the agenda of a, a small company or or even a medium-sized company in that you know they've got the things that they want to do with their marketing that n- might not necessarily reflect what you want to do. The other thing is, 
uh, large companies who are operating at a very different level, they may have budgets in the millions of dollars, they may have a time span in the years. Uh, and so they might have a very different budget, very different time frame to what you do. And so you've got to do what works in, to get a customer today. You've got to uh, build a strategy that's going to help you get new leads, new clients, new, new uh, people in the door da daily, monthly, and weekly. And so that's a very, very different strategy. And the, what works for them is direct response marketing. I think direct response marketing is very, very powerful. You know, uh, I've heard a lot of people say, start with why. I like to tell my clients, start with buy. Let's get clients in the door and then we can uh, build our brand on the back of that. Because when you look at some of the really big successful brands, they didn't start with big flashy billboards and big branding advertising campaigns. They started with, for example, in the case of Nike, it was a guy who was selling shoes out of the back of his uh, car at athletic track meets, right? So that's how that big brand started. So sometimes it's easy to forget about the origin stories of some of these big brands, but almost all of them start with buy. They don't start with brand or the why and all of that sort of stuff. Alan, in many ways, your your book is a manual, a guide for startups and entrepreneurs that you know are on a shoestring budget and have to get money in the door because cash is the lifeblood of their business, as it is for any organization, but the runway, of course, is shorter. Let's start first with some sobering advice. If you were speaking to a Fortune 5000 CMO or perhaps you know, a large organization that has a bigger cushion, what are some of the pieces of advice you would give to large organizations to remember some of the principles around marketing that might be lost in all of their political constituencies and uh -huh. the, the, the politicking they have to do? What are some sobering in the face reminders you'd like to remind all of the major corporate CMOs of? It's super simple. It's like, how can we capture the details of our ideal target market and have ongoing conversations with them? How can we nurture them and develop a lot of value with them over time? So yes, uh, all, of, all of what you're doing might be really, really good from a branding perspective, from a name recognition perspective, but I want to have a list of who my ideal prospects are. I want to send them valuable information over time. I want to nurture them and I want to develop them into high probability prospects. So I want to deal with people who might buy from me in 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, a year from now, two years from now, really building that pipeline. And I view it as uh, kind of putting deposits in that bank account. So I, I continually add value and then one day I can make a withdrawal. So, and we don't know whether making that withdrawal will happen today, you know, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days down the track. But what we want to do is, you know, take some of the principles of direct response marketing, which works so well for small and medium businesses and which work amazingly well for large businesses as, as well. And really go back to basics. You know, sometimes uh, we've gotten uh, too sophisticated for our own liking. And so uh, going back to basics, which is really capturing leads, nurturing them, building value over time and creating those conversations. I think conversational marketing will become more important than ever before. If you're selling anything of reasonable value, conversions are going to come as a result of conversations with your ideal target market. Alan, let's expand on that. Level set for those listeners and viewers that may not have responsibility for marketing. We of mm. course know everybody has responsibility for the brand of an organization in terms of how they yes. themselves are a brand ambassador. How would you define direct response marketing? What does that mean? Break that down a bit for people. Yeah, so direct response marketing has a few elements. So for example, it's trackable, it's measurable. We usually use compelling headlines and copy. Um, it targets very specific audiences. So it's kind of like, um, if you think of a billboard, it's the opposite of that. Like Coca-Cola doesn't know which billboard made you buy that Coca-Cola, right? So that it's very difficult to, to be able to uh, reverse engineer a return on investment. And I know there's certain metrics around name recognition and all of that sort of brand recall and all of that sort of stuff. But we can't say, look, we spent $10,000 on this billboard and it returned $18,000 in terms of back-end profits. We, you know, in, in all honesty, we can't say that. Whereas with direct response marketing, we, we can know how many people clicked on an ad, how many people opted in, um, how many people uh, uh, responded, how many people purchased in the, in the end. So 
it demands a response. Whereas uh, most brand based or mass marketing kind of approaches are based on the idea that, hey, if someone sees our brand often enough, they'll recall it when they when they need. And like I said, that can work at a large scale. If you've got a big enough budget and a long enough timeline, that can work. But the principles of direct response are super powerful where we, we use compelling headlines, compelling copy, we capture leads, we're able to measure at every step of the funnel. So we know, for example, if we're not getting enough clicks, okay, maybe our ad copy isn't good enough. Or if we're getting lots of clicks, but not many opt-ins, then we know, hey, the offer may not be compelling enough. Or we, if we're getting lots of opt-ins, but we're not getting conversions, well, then maybe there's a problem with our sales conversion strategy. So it's very honest marketing in terms of like, we know exactly how much we spent. We know exactly what it returned. And, you know, I found in some larger businesses, the, the CMO or the whoever's responsible for their marketing often doesn't want to know these exact numbers. They want to be able to, uh, to talk about things that are a bit more fluffy, like uh, engagement and brand awareness and all yeah. of that. But they don't want to know the raw numbers of, hey, we spent this much and we returned this much. I think you are right. I wrote a book on my own career in marketing, and I think a lot of marketers, uh, this may insult some marketers, but escape and hide in marketing because yes. they don't want the responsibility and the accountability of the sales side of the company. And I think that's a yeah. big cancer in organizations is that kind of constant fighting between sales and marketing. It's most CEOs' worst nightmare is how do I get sales and marketing aligned. Your book, again, is uh, as designated by Amazon, the number one uh, global marketing book for five year, years running. So I'd like to have you opine on a couple of ideals. I was talking with a, a renowned US-based marketing professor whose name uh -huh. you would recognize if I were to mention it. And a few uh -huh. weeks ago, he talked about how important it is to, to um, know your, what he called your TAD, your total addressable market. Uh -huh. And then on the opposite side, Seth Godin, who has been a guest on our program and is a friend of ours will tell you, no, 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 it should be your smallest viable market, right? Is, you know, how do you grow your business with the least customers possible to make sure that they're, you know, taken care of? Where do you come on that in between total addressable market and your smallest viable market? They're not exactly at the opposite ends. Where do you come in on that conversation? Yeah, I think there's multiple ways to be right. But what I like to, to have, a, I like to have a very defined target market. So uh, in what Seth Godin is saying that the mini, minimum target market, but we want an, a niche that's an inch wide and a mile deep. So, um, you know, we can, you can have a very tightly defined niche, but there's not enough people in there that to make it worthwhile. But we want a niche that's an inch wide and a mile deep. So an inch wide meaning, hey, we can create an avatar of our ideal target audience. We know exactly what they're thinking. We know what they're dreaming about. We know what they're worried about. We know what they're, they're staying up at 3 a.m. concerned about. You know, you have a big problem when I ask you what your target market is and you say something like, everyone, you know, everyone can use our product or everyone can buy our product because if you say everyone, it's really no one. You wanna have a very tightly defined target market and within that, there can be a lot of depth as well. So, uh, so I think uh, you need to be going for an addressable market that's an inch wide and a mile deep. So that's tightly defined, but there, there's a, enough in there to really make it worth your while. Alan, the late uh, professor and author Clayton Christensen was a member of our board of directors, right? Known by all in the world as one of the greatest innovative yep. minds in our generation. And, and Clayton, was obsessed with the job to be done, right? And defining yes. the circumstance your client is in. What is their exact circumstance? Would you riff a little bit on what you think the importance is of, of knowing the circumstance your client is in? Is that, is that another, another term for an avatar? Uh, what would you say about that? Yeah, I, I, I love the way uh, Clayton Christian uh, explained uh, his concepts, and I agree with a lot of uh, what he uh, he used to teach. Um, one of the things that I often see in organisations is uh, marketing for marketing's sake or technology for technology's sake, and I like to make sure within all of our business systems and especially our marketing systems. Uh, whether it's our CRM system, whether it's our the way we define our avatar, that we treat each piece like its own employee. So with an employee, you don't just let them do whatever they want, whenever they want. Um, you, uh, you have KPIs, you have metrics, you have goals. So what is this piece of technology employed 
to do? What's its job? And, you know, how do we track that it's on track or off track? So whether it's a website, a CRM system. So if we if we uh, were to go and ask a company, what's the purpose of your website? Well, they might say, you know, to show our products and services to convert to whatever. But you need to have some specific metrics that are going to tell you, is it working? Is it on track? Is it doing a really good job? Uh, should we promote it or should we fire it? Um, and so uh, you want to have very clearly defined metrics for each piece of technology, for each uh, step in your marketing process, and then you know if it's on track or off track. So for example, for our own website, the metric that really matters most is the number of email opt-ins. We know that the more email opt-ins that we get, the more it's going to impact revenue positively. If email opt-ins plummet for whatever reason, maybe there's a technical issue with the website or whatever, that's an alarm bell where we, we need to uh, see what is going on. Is it a technical issue with the website? Is it something that's not converting well or whatever else? And it's a great early warning system because we can address it before it impacts revenue. So rather than getting to the end of the quarter and saying, hang on, uh, we've had a dip in sales or whatever, we know that this is a, a lead metric that's going to uh, end up on the bottom line. So we can address it early on. And so I want people to be thinking about that from a marketing perspective that uh, each piece in your marketing uh, system needs to have metrics and KPIs and be treated like an employee. This book is insanely valuable and also insanely popular. The title is The One Page Marketing Plan. So let's talk to that. I'd like to do about a nine minute speed round with you. And sure. the canvas for a one page marketing plan has sort of nine components. The first three prospect, focus, the next three are lead focus, and the last three are sort of customer focused. Let's have a yep. one minute conversation on each of these nine components. I'll pitch you the title. You give our listeners and viewers kind of the best understanding of why each of these nine components is vital to their one page marketing plan. First is my target market. Riff on that. Yeah. So as I alluded to earlier, a lot of times the mistake people make is, hey, my target market's everybody. Uh, you know, we're in the medical industry or we're in the chiropractic industry or IT or whatever, and we can serve everyone. And it seems kind of logical that, hey, if we cast the largest net, um, that'll get us the best result. And so my view is, and my experience is that if you cast a, a too wide a net, you're going to appeal to nobody. So what we want is for our ideal target market to say, hey, that's for me. And so that's why you want a very tightly defined target market. And I'm not saying you can't do take on business outside of your target market, but from a marketing perspective, we want to be laser focused. We want to, we want to focus on our ideal target market and put all of our energy behind that. And if we can dominate that target market, we can add another and another and another. But being too scattered, that's going to be deadly for your marketing. Segment number two is my message to my target market. Yeah. Messaging is so critical. Uh, messaging is really what we want to do from a messaging perspective is we want to enter the conversation that's already going in the mind of our target market. So what are they dreaming about? What are they afraid of? Uh, what are they staying up at 3 a.m. worried about? And we want to enter that conversation. And uh, if we haven't defined our target market, like in step one, we're going to have a very hard time with messaging and messaging is something that we will continually evolve over time. So as we get better and more information and as we test more campaigns and more offers, we'll see, hey, this message resonates well with our audience. And again, we want our audience to, to see that message and say, hey, that's for me. I need that. And so that's, go that's going to be a function of tightly defining your target market and having a message that really lands well with your audience. Alan, on this topic, Donald Miller is a very famous American marketing influencer. Of course, yes. his fame as an author from Build a Story Brand to Marketing Made Simple. He's obsessed with the fact that so many organizations are, are, are telling their story through their message. And in fact, yes. most customers don't care about your story. If they can't find themselves in the story, they don't care. Expand on that. Of course. Uh, so really what, what people care about is themselves and that's their favorite topic. And so rather than being self-focused, 
uh, I teach clients to be problem solution focused. So talk about the problem that you solve uh, uh, rather than talking about yourself. So many times you go to a, an about page of a website and it's talking about how they founded their company with their grandfather in 1975 and so on and how many qualified people they've got. The about page on your website is about your prospect, about your client, not about you. So a lot of people have this backwards. So it's so important to be focused on the problem uh, that your prospect has because that is what is going to resonate from a messaging perspective. It's not how qualified you are, how awesome you are, how great your product is and how innovative you, you all are. That's kind of all really irrelevant. We, people want to know, hey, I've got this problem and this person really gets me. You know, if some, you know, if you've ever read copy that's really resonated with you, 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 you'll, you understand this. Like, you're like, hey, this person really understands what I'm going through. Yeah. This person really understands my mindset. And that has a massively different impact than reading copy that is uh, uh, all self-focused and, hey, we're really awesome. We won all of these awards, all of this sort of stuff. No one really cares about any of that. Okay, third section in the prospecting section of the one-page marketing plan is the media I will use to reach my target market. Mm. Expand on that. Yes. So really the bridge between your target market and your messaging is your media. So that's how you're going to reach your audience. So how are we going to get that message out to our ideal target market? And we want to be where our ideal audience uh, lives. So that may be on Facebook, on Google, on, you know, through uh, snail mail, whatever. And I like taking a multimedia approach. Uh, you know, I, with with the rise of digital marketing, I think there's been an, there's a, an opportunity has opened up with using traditional media like snail mail, like postcards, like uh, shock and awe packages and things like that. And uh, our digital inboxes are now more full than ever before. And our physical inboxes are less crowded than ever before. So there's an opportunity there. I'm not saying digital is bad or anything like that. Uh, we use digital marketing extensively, but I think taking a multimedia approach and really, I mean, there's almost nothing like getting a physical package. People still get excited by that or a handwritten note. These things all seem old school. And even though uh, digital has risen so, so much, there's an even bigger opportunity right now to use some of these physical mediums to, to reach out to clients. We've used this very, very effectively with clients in e-commerce where uh, things like handwritten notes, postcards, things in the mail work extraordinarily well. Alan, I could not agree more with you because I don't know about you, but between my multiple accounts, I'm approaching sometimes close to a thousand emails a day. Absolutely. The vast majority of them, fortunately, are sequestered by our corporate filters. They go to spam and they go to yep. trash and clutter. I don't see 90% of them, but, but the other 200 that get through, I now know that most of them are being sent to me through an automated marketing management system, some kind of, you yep. know, you know, Marketo or Eloqua, or whatever it is, they all are highly yeah. customized as if they were my best friend. And so for me, email has kind of hit a bit of tipping point. I, I don't even barely mm. open it or use it in my own business. But to yeah. your point, I think there is a really um, prime opportunity to use what you call snail mail. We would call, you know, regular print mail, or perhaps mm. as you said, a package or a note. This yeah. is kind of a bit contrarian to this sort of obsession with, you know, UX and, and, and email and such. Uh, yeah. Is there, are there some examples of when you've seen, now again, you believe in surround sound and orchestra of media. Is there an example yes, of when you have found that a handwritten note or a postcard or a direct mail piece has actually performed better even during the pandemic or post pandemic than digital has? I, I think even more so during the pandemic because people are, are, are starved for connection. So um, getting a handwritten note, I can't tell you how many times uh, we've gotten a conversion because someone's received a handwritten note from us or a package with the book and a handwritten note. It's so, so powerful. Uh, you know, it just think about it this way. You know, let's say it's your uh, wedding anniversary and you send your wife a lovely text versus a bunch of flowers and a handwritten note. Which one is going to ha have the impact? Yes, the, the text uh, is quite uh, quite nice, but uh, I don't know about 
you, but my uh, my wife will respond much better to a handwritten note and a bunch of flowers. So ha- something physical can have a much, much bigger impact. And I'm not saying only go for physical or only right. digital. I think having that surround sound, that, um, that uh, multimedia approach is super powerful. Extremely well said. Let's move on now to the next three sections on the one page marketing plan. Number four is my lead capture system. Talk about that. Yes, so many people go to a lot of trouble and expense to build a website, to get traffic to their website and all of that sort of thing. And the vast majority of that is wasted because here's what we know. We know that about 3% of your total addressable market on average, obviously depends on industry, but about 3% are ready to buy today. So the vast majority of people who are looking for something are not ready to buy today. They might be ready in 30 days, in 60 days, in 90 days, in a year, two years time. And so if we're not capturing those leads, we're wasting a massive opportunity. And uh, I see this so often where you click on an ad and it just goes to somebody's homepage or, uh, or maybe even goes to a landing page, but they're not capturing leads. So you're building a database that is so valuable that you're, you're, you know, you're developing your future revenue by capturing those leads. And so many times people are just wasting that opportunity. They're spending so much money on ads. They're spending so much money on branding. Then they get people to the place that want to go and it's a wasted opportunity. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I've got probably uh, uh, 50 tabs open in uh, in my browser at any one time. And each one of those tabs represents uh, an intention to go back to that website. But in all honesty, you know, probably my computer will crash or whatever else, and I'll never go back to, to those tabs. And your prospects are the same. Even if they have full intention to come back to your website or to your offer or to whatever in a week time, two weeks time, in a month's time, they probably won't. So unless you've captured those leads and then had the opportunity to keep in touch with them. Alan, four you just mentioned was my lead capture system. Five is my lead nurturing system. What is the difference? Exactly. So lead capture is about getting people into your database. It's about building that uh, asset, that permission asset to use a a Seth Godin um, terminology. So we want to build that permission asset. Now, lead nurturing is all about starting uh, to add value to them, to create a conversation. And like I said earlier, conversions are going to come from conversations. So rather than just, hey, buy our stuff, we're really awesome. We want to have a conversation that enters the mind of that prospect. So how can we take them from being vaguely interested? So they've they're on our database, which means they put their hand up and said, look, I'm vaguely interested in what you've got to offer. Tell me more about it. And so this is our opportunity to have that conversation with them. And that conversation can be literally over the phone. It could be over email. It could be over whatever channel is relevant and appropriate for your business. But uh, like I said, if you sell anything of reasonable value, having a conversation with your ideal target market is going to be what leads to conversion. So we, you know, so many times, I see particularly large companies, they send their marketing emails and they're very heavily branded. There's a lot of HTML, there's a lot of branding and they come from an email address like no reply at or sales (laughs) at or whatever. And I'm like, why would you not want people to reply to your marketing emails? Why would you want to, to position yourself with all the other spam that's in people's inboxes? And so that's the craziest stuff I've ever seen. So we, I want people to reply to my marketing emails. I want to have conversations with my ideal target market. And so from a nurturing perspective, um, that's what you want to set up. You are speaking my language, my friend. Number six is my sales conversion strategy. Yes. So if you've done the first five steps right, so if you've selected your target market, you've got powerful message, you've got, you're using a really good media strategy, you're capturing leads, you're nurturing leads, sales is going to become so much easier, so much smoother. It's going to be something that's going to be enjoyable. It's not going to be something that you're going to have to push and use all of these crazy kind of closed techniques and things like that. And I'm a big believer in 
at removing the silos between sales and marketing. I, th I think of it just as the revenue department, because traditionally we think of, you know, marketing and sales and, you know, the sales department says, hey, you're sending us crappy leads and the marketing department saying, hey, you can't close our awesome leads. So I, I, I think merging those departments just into the revenue department where they're working together and, uh, you know, like I said, if you've done the first five steps, it's going to be super easy. You're going to get to the sales stage and it's essentially going to be order taking if we've done our job well from a marketing perspective. Alan, it's readily apparent to all of our listeners and viewers why this book has done so well and your expertise. Let's land the plane with the last three here. We're moving now on to the customer experience, if you will. Number seven is how I deliver world-class customer experience. Yes. So, a lot of people believe marketing finishes when you've made the sale, right? We made the sale, marketing done. Uh, I think nothing could be further from the truth. The, the real money is made on the back end. So you've acquired that customer. And so we want to turn them in from being transactional to being raving fans because raving fans are where the profit is. So when you launch a new product and you've got a lot of brand equity where people love what you do, they're looking forward to your next product, they'll even buy it sight unseen in, in a lot of circumstances, that's as a re result of you creating that tribe of raving fans. So we want to be a voice of value to our tribe of raving fans. So we want to be, you know, chances are whatever you sell, there's probably other people selling very, very similar products to you. And so the difference is going to be whether you can be a voice of value to your tribe, whether you can add value to them. And a lot of that comes from what you do uh, in your content marketing. So uh, can you have an opinion? Can you stand for something? Uh, so a lot of uh, business leaders, they're afraid to, to take a stand. They're afraid to have an opinion. And so to me, there's nothing more frustrating than when you read like a, a review or, of a product or something and they, they don't have an opinion. They're like, uh, oh, this product has these pros and cons and that product has that, those pros and cons. I'll, I, I'm like, no, tell me, tell me wh uh, what I should buy. Uh, you know, take a uh, take a stand, take a leadership position. And so leadership is an attractive quality. And so from a marketing perspective, we want to be thought leaders and voices of value to our tribe and build that tribe of raving fans. Number eight is how I increase customer lifetime value. Yes. So how can we take that tribe of raving fans and get them to buy in more quantity, more quality, more frequency? So basically, taking them from uh, the first initial sale. And this is really where the money is made on the back end. You know, you've spent all of this money to acquire a new client and a lot of people just stop there. I can't tell you how many times we've worked with a client and they've got a, a list of thousands of past clients. And when we ask them, when was the last time that client heard from you? When did they last get an e email from you or something in the mail or in the physical mail or anything like that? And the answer, sadly, often is, well, never. Um, so, you know, I I want most people to put more effort into their back end than they do into their front end. Uh, that That's how you grow a really fast business. That's how you generate new referrals. And we'll get into referrals in a moment. But uh, really, uh, how do we get people to buy more frequently in more quality, more quantity from us? And how do we uh, take them up that a set path of ascension. So having a product that's uh, uh, either a higher version or a higher premium or a bigger plan or whatever else. So taking them from where they are to where they should be. Alan, I think that's a business principle that's violated in nearly every aspect of organizations, right? We spend more mm -hmm. time recruiting new employees than we do retaining yes. and re-recruiting our current employees. We spend more time prospecting, landing new customers than we do attending to and nurturing our current clients. I mean, as, as hunters, as salespeople, we're always sort of looking on the, on, in the future. But if you can just imagine that if, if, if organizations, if leaders spend as much time recruiting new clients as they did retaining their current clients, your marketing spend would plummet. You, you know, you might redirect it, but the lifetime value of your client would be exponential. Why, why do you think humans, leaders, vice presidents of sales, chief marketing officers, chief human resource officers, we all tend to spend a disproportion of our time recruiting versus retaining. Is it just exhilarating? It's more fun? What, what's your psychological assessment of that? It, it, it's exactly what you said. It's uh, a lot of these people and 
you know, like most entrepreneurs, and I feel that way too. We're, we're hunters, right? We we like the 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 taste of fresh blood in our mouth, right? So that's exciting. That's you know the hunt, the chase, and all of that. It's not as sexy and exciting to uh, market to existing clients or to create a reactivation campaign and all of those sorts of things. But that's really where the money is. When I look at some of our fastest growing clients. It's people who, first of all, retain the clients that they've won, but also manage to get them to buy more frequently uh, in higher quality, higher quantity, whatever's relevant to their business. And so that's how you build a really high growth business because you've done the difficult and expensive part, which is gotten the person to buy for the first time. And someone who's bought from you for the first time is a far more a qualified person to to buy from you again than someone who's cold and never heard of you. I'm mindful of our time, so let's land the plane with number nine, how I orchestrate and stimulate referrals. You alluded to this, expand on that. Yeah, so if we've built a tribe of raving fans and we're, we're creating, we're being that voice of value, and I purposely titled the chapter Orchestrating and Stimulating Referrals because most organizations hope and pray for referrals. They hope that if they do a good job, that the client will remember that and refer them. And that sometimes uh, does work to some extent, but we wanna orchestrate and stimulate referrals. It's a uh, process that we do deliberately. So we wanna plan that out like a chess master. So we, we wanna know what are the five moves ahead that are going to help people refer. And so we wanna arm our referral network. So uh, be able to give them something that they can pass on on, on our behalf that will make them look good again so a lot of people approach referrals from the perspective of, hey, please do me a favor. Would you would you refer someone you know? No. Uh, when someone creates a referral for you, they're doing themselves a favor. So like when I recommend a movie or a restaurant to my friend, it's not because I want to do a favor to the movie chain or to the restaurant. It's because I had a good time and I want my friend to have a good time. And if my friend has a good time, that will come back to me and he'll say, Alan, that was an awesome referral. We, yeah. we went out, yeah. we went to that restaurant, we had an amazing time. So, you know, understanding the psychology of referrals and helping orchestrate that within your organization is incredibly important. Alan, let's, let's end on this insight. There are certainly fundamental principles that, governing, that govern marketing that apply to all businesses, whether you are you know, a startup or a, or a Fortune 50. And then yes. of course there are avenues and platforms and channels that may or may not be right for your business. TikTok and billboards aren't probably the same marketing channel for the same types of businesses. As yes. you kind of put on your, your, your futurist glasses as a marketer, as an innovator, take out your crystal ball, what do you see are the most effective marketing strategies that anybody could leave today's podcast with to, to say, think about this, whether you are the CMO of Exxon or whether you are the small business owner of a recycled furniture store, what are some fundamental things you want entrepreneurs, business owners, that matter CMOs to remember as they leave today's podcast? Yeah, there's, there's two things. So first of all, understanding that, look, the best marketer wins every time. And that's something that I learned the difficult and expensive way. So, you know, I wish that the marketplace was a meritocracy where the best product, the best service won. And, you know, we've been sold this, this uh, illusion that, hey, build it and they will come. You know, build it and they will come is a great movie plot. It's a terrible marketing and business strategy. So understanding that the best marketer wins every time. Now, the other trend that I uh, I see that's going to become uh, more and more important and, and that is already Already there is that conversational marketing. You know, we, we've gone from uh, sales and marketing being very customized, very conversational. Then, then we've got, then we've had this digital revolution, and then we've got companies hiding behind their websites and behind contact us pages and forms and things like that. And I think now we're going to be returning to that. Uh, conversational and customized marketing approach where we're having conversations with our ideal target market, whether it be through through online chat, whether it be over the phone, whether it be through Zoom, whatever it is, but 
conversations are what are going to be leading to conversion. So rather than thinking about things like cost per click or cost per acquisition, I want you to be thinking about cost per conversation with your ideal target market. So that's something that I would be optimizing for um, from a marketing perspective. Alan, why has this book sold so insanely well? You, you are not a, a global celebrity. I, I don't really know how big your social media is. I know a little bit about you, but this book has taken the world by storm. Why has it done so well? I think it's done well because uh, it's, I'm not a, uh, educated uh, with MBA, PhDs. I haven't taken a theoretical academic approach. I've written in, in very easy to understand conversational language. But more importantly, I wrote the book I wish I had in my first business. You know, I got a lot of value uh, in my first business when I was learning marketing from each and every book, you know, I, I read Seth Goad and I, re I attended seminars, I had mentors and I got a little piece from each of them, but there was nothing that literally took me from A to Z to really understand marketing well. And literally in my book, in the first uh, chapter, I define what is marketing. I literally go from okay. zero to hero in the marketing uh, book there. And I wrote the book I wish I had when I, when I was first learning and struggling and banging my head against a, a brick wall trying to figure this stuff out. So I think that's really resonated with people, uh, that approach where it's easy to understand, easy to read, easy to follow and easy to implement. And I think um, that's why it's done well. If there is one common thread that is an answer I ask authors, what they usually say is, I wrote the book I needed to read. And it is a common theme amongst authors that have these wildly best-selling books. Alan Dibb, thank you for joining us early on the Australian side of the world this morning. Thank you for getting up and being part of our global podcast. We appreciate your time today. The book is The One Page Marketing Plan. It has revolutionized and challenged, reinforced many of the things that I know to be true from my own marketing career as an author myself of marketing books. This book is a masterpiece. Alan, thank you again for your generosity today. Thank you, Scott. It was a pleasure to be on. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. We appreciate you. If you aren't subscribing to On Leadership, please visit franklincovey.com. Click on the On Leadership tab. Subscribe yourself. Comes out every Tuesday in an email. Includes a blog post from me, a downloadable tool. You also can review us and rank us on all your favorite podcast platforms. And we'll see you back here next week for a new conversation on leadership. Mm -hmm.